pushing myself to do my best is, you know, all I can really ask for. Um, I've, I've struggled with failure in the past, always comparing myself, whether it's a qualifying time or making the Olympic team or just beating another swimmer. And I realized that as long as I'm doing better than I've ever done, you know, there's nothing more I can ask myself. Welcome to Champions Mojo Weekly Podcast with your hosts, Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. You'll hear authentic, entertaining stories with tips, lessons, and wisdom from champions to inspire, motivate, and educate you. You'll get the tools you need for becoming a true champion in your own life. And now, your host, Kelly Palace. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Champions Mojo Podcast, where I am co-hosting with Maria Parker. Today's show is fantastic. Some might even call it insane because we have an interview with Zane Grothy, who has occasionally been called Insane Zane because the feats that he has accomplished are considered by some to be insane. However, after interviewing this thoughtful, composed, authentic, brilliant athlete with an incredibly big heart, I would never call Zane insane. What are your thoughts on today's interview, Maria? I completely agree. This guy was and is amazing. He, The things that he said in his interview have really stuck with me. I can't wait for our listeners to hear it and to talk about it with you, Kelly. Wonderful. Before we go into the interview, I want to cover some of Zane's accomplishments and background. I know a lot of people know that Zane's story is a testament to perseverance. He was going to quit swimming after he started into a stellar career at Auburn University's, you know, freshman, sophomore, junior year. And his senior year uh, fell a little short. So he was frustrated and and did not swim faster his senior year and then went, uh, I think, back home to swim with his his coach and, and still was getting slower. And so he totally picked up everything and moved to Bloomington, Indiana uh, to train with the post-grad group there. And uh, he started seeing great success. And he has now, after, you know, qualifying for several international teams, he's won multiple national titles. He destroyed our two American records in short course and winter nationals um, in 2017. Then, like I said, he won a couple of titles in 2018 at nationals, and he's been tearing it up on the pro swim series. Um, So he is our king of distance right now. And he's, I wouldn't even call him just a distance swimmer. He is actually great at the 200. Um, you know, could could very well be one of our top 200 swimmers representing the U.S. on the the four by 200 relay, and and swims all the way up to the mile and and even beyond that. So um, this is truly one of our top freestylers that we've ever had in the U.S. And it, it's just it's a great interview. So um, what else, Maria? Well, he's uh, is obviously an incredible swimmer, but I am so impressed. Uh, with his accomplishments outside of swimming. He has a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering. And after a pro swimming career, he one day wants to work for Boeing or SpaceX. Very cool. Kelly, I'm excited to break down this interview with a fellow endurance athlete. I was very inspired listening. Can't wait to talk about it with you after we hear his interview. So let's get right into the interview, which was done at the Pro Swim Series in Bloomington, Indiana at... uh, Zane Grothy's hometown pool there where he is training now. So enjoy the interview. And now it's time for the road trip segment. Zane Grothy, welcome to Champions Mojo. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. So Zane, you um, have just been introduced and your accolades are just amazing being our premier distance swimmer in the country and one of the things that um, distance athletics is famous for is dealing with discomfort so I wanted to start with that and see how you deal with that when you get in that threshold mode and you're in pain 
Yeah, so one of the things I, one of the tricks I do is I, I make things very personal when it comes to um, either practicing that or, or even doing the long distance racing. Um, the human body is, it's so natural for the human body to shy away from pain. And that's, that's the natural instinct, especially in a race. When things hurt, you think things are going wrong and you, you, you automatically assume you're not, you're not going to have enough, you know, energy or whatever you got at the end of the race. So you, you naturally want to hold back and draw away from it. Um, but one of the things I do in my training and my races is I just challenge myself. Like, how much can I make it hurt? You know, when it gets to that point where it starts hurting, I think, I, I got more than this. I can, you know, whether it's, whether I'm going to swim faster or not at the end of the race, I can take more pain than this. So I can, I just keep pushing myself and push it to the point where, you know, my body starts failing and then I'm like, you know, that's not that bad. It just, I understand when my body's breaking down, but I could handle that, you know, and it, it really gives me a lot of mental confidence knowing that I can push my body to the point where it'll, it'll really fail before, you know, my mind does. And that really helps me, you know, especially when I get to like a real tough rest, say the 400, I'll get to about halfway and think, you're going to have to make it hurt a lot more than me because I'm ready for this. So that's what I do. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So when you're in that, um, you said your body fails before your mind. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so let's say you're in the, like you just set the American record in the 1650 Mm -hmm. and, um, let's say you're at the thousand. At what point in that, in that 1650, are you just like, are you on that edge of failing? Um, when I got to roughly the 800 to 1200 mark in that 1650 that was that was the real mental battle for me i wanted to make a shift in my stroke to um, kind of pull harder and kind of dig a little bit deeper at about the 800 and i couldn't will myself to get there until about the 1200 i really kind of slowly built into it but once i hit that 1200 it was locked in and it just started charging if you if you see the record splits compared to my splits in that race i kind of hold even through that, that through that 400 mark there and once i hit that 1200 it just really drops and i'm just i'm locked in for that point but um, yeah, I'd say getting through that thousand. Once you get to the thousand mark of a 1650, if you think you've gone too hard, you're probably right where you need to be. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so are you a lap counter, left, right, middle, every other, skip them, don't want to see them? What's your, what are your lap cards? Um, I've realized it's, it's better for me to have it on the right side just because I breathe on the right side and that's kind of more the way I'm leaning when I'm looking forward um, in my stroke um, cadence. But um, usually a lot of times I don't like to look. I'll just keep my head down. You know, if, I, if, I, if I'm if i worried about where I'm at, I need to gauge my effort or the pain levels, I'll, I'll take a look. But a lot of times I just keep my head down and just keep motoring through. And at what, what numbers do you feel excited about seeing? Um, for the 1650, I'd say definitely hitting the 500 mark and the 1000 mark. And then hitting the 1150 mark, knowing that I just have 500 yards left, that uh, that that really gets me going. Awesome. So, in your everyday life, um, what techniques do you use from being that tough mentally and swimming that you can that you transfer over to your real life? I'd say I'd say being disciplined and understanding that being able to push myself. Um, whether it's, you know, doing work or homework or anything like that, pushing myself to do my best is, you know, all I can really ask for. Um, I've, I've struggled with failure in the past, always comparing myself, whether it's a qualifying time or making the Olympic team or just beating another swimmer. And I realized that as long as I'm doing better than I've ever done, you know, there's nothing more I can ask myself. So being able to bring that in my regular life and, you know, sometimes I, you know, I, um, I get my chores done or sometimes I get to the grocery store or sometimes I don't, you know, I just tell myself, okay, you know, that was the best you could do right now. And, you know, maybe you could get another hour later or maybe you'll get it tomorrow, but being able to push myself and feeling confident that I'm, I'm doing everything I can do really helps. And do you, obviously you're swimming a lot. Can you just give us some, you know, basic training, a basic training week and what kind of time and distance that's involving? Yeah. Um, my week, I have 10 practices. I, I've just switched it over to nine practices, but I, for the last four years, it's been 10 practices a week. I double on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then I got a single on a long single on Wednesday. It's usually our distance day. And then some race pace on Saturday and take Sunday off. Um, I got three lifts during the week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And uh, every single practice works on something a little bit different. So it's a good way to do it. And are you doing any mental training? I'd say a lot of my mental training comes from 
um, the mindset I have during practices. You know, if I'm setting up, you know, a couple thousands to send on, say, that Wednesday practice, um, when I start getting close to the, the end of them, I, I start focusing and, and kind of imagining how it would feel being in the race, you know, how it would imagine if someone was next to me, slightly ahead of me or slightly behind me and they're trying to catch me. I kind of put myself in that position. And it's, it's amazing how powerful the mind is when you do something like that. And especially when I'm in the water and I can't hear much, I can't see much. And you just, it's just total mind control at that point. Um, it's amazing what my own heart rate will do despite not even going harder. My heart rate will rise because my adrenaline will be rushing and um, the body just wants to, wants to get into that situation. Um, another, another, another thing I do is uh, watching back my video. Um, I saw my 400 freestyle from last night popped up on YouTube. So I watched it and I watched it with my mom and she thought that was pretty cool. And then she went to go clean the kitchen and I think I watched it another five or six times just analyzing every stroke I was taking, every kick I was taking, how I was feeling, um, being, a, being like an almost like an out of body experience, being able to watch myself knowing I had just competed that and, and feeling like, okay, this is how hard I was going. This is what it looked like. You know, what, how did my technique um, look at the end of the race when I was hurting the most and um, just just really encompassing everything that you know putting the pieces together that way that's beautiful and um, so with all that training do you have a special diet I wouldn't say it's anything special um, I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables I know those are those are killer those antioxidants for replenishing the muscles in the system um, when I first moved to Indiana I was taking um, I started I started taking supplements a um, little bit of protein, a little bit of carbohydrate and everything, and I've really backed away from most everything now. Um, I've realized and, you know, it's really kind of hit me that most everything I need is coming from my diet already and uh, getting those fresh fruits and vegetables and getting getting a balanced meal and getting the, the fruits and vegetables for the antioxidants really is, is good. I don't count calories or anything. Um, the biggest thing for me is if I'm eating healthy food, I just got to make sure I get enough of it. And during a practice, are you hydrating a lot? I wouldn't say I hydrate that much. I probably hydrate a lot less than a lot of my, of my other teammates. I grew up swimming out in southern Nevada in 110 degree heat in an 85 degree pool and just, you know, I would bring one water bottle and, you know, I just learned to ration that water bottle through practice and I think I, I, I probably only drink about 10 ounces of fluid um, throughout a two hour workout. But because of that, I think my body has just adapted, you know, over my 20 years of training hard and I am very water efficient. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, so growing up and in you know the last several years where you've really just broken through here, have you had any role models that you've aspired to be like or that have inspired you? As far as um, swimming goes and even kind of outside of swimming, I've had a few role models when I was growing up when I was younger. I was looking at Michael Phelps and, you know, how he just – would break records like it, it didn't mean anything, you know, and the, 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 the limits of records, you always think like that's as fast as a person can go. But the way he broke records, like it didn't, it didn't matter. It didn't apply to him. And that was really cool. Um, another, another role model I looked up to was a guy who came from my club team. He, he ended up swimming at Auburn too. He had an undefeated four years. His name was Kurt Cady, undefeated in dual meets, SEC championships and NCAAs, won, won four rings and everything. And one what of the, um, he was a breaststroke I amer. Okay. And uh, one of the things that really stuck out to me was I just – I it was kind of a guy from my club team. He'd come back every now and then. I just idolized him so much because of how good he was. And he was never better than anyone else off the pool deck – or out of the pool, you know, on the pool deck. And he was – he would talk to me all the time. I, I had a million questions for him, and I'm sure it was so annoying for him to just answer <laughs> these little things. But, you know, he was such a cool guy. And I thought to myself, like, man, like, no matter how fast you get or how th good you think you are, like – I mean, once you're out of the pool, you're no different than anyone else. And so I really looked up to that. I'd say lately, um, I really like watching guys like Michael Andrew and Caleb Dressel. You know, I know they're, I know they're a good deal younger than me, but kind of like the way Phelps was racing, you know, 10 years ago or so. Watching those guys swim, it's just like every time Michael Andrew dives in the water, you think like, oh, he can't possibly do it again. And he races fast <laughs> again. And then Caleb, you know, especially watching Caleb at, say, Budapest World Championships 2017, just race after race after race, getting you're breaking records and swimming that fast. It was like kind of like watching re re reincarnation of Phelps again. Just the records and the, those rules just didn't apply. So it was really cool to watch that. That is cool. And, and so that's great to know that a guy that's at your level can be inspired by guys that are at the same level. So wonderful. And um, if you 
What do you do when you are behind the block and you know it's a big race? Do you get butterflies? I mean, what what is your like pre-race? Because I when you're in there dealing with the pain, that's one thing. But then when you know it's a big race and the light's shining on you, what what are your thoughts? I'd say that the biggest thing that helps me is practicing it. You know, let's say a meet like this, the Bloomington Pro Series, you know, I, I knew I could get up in that 400 and, and probably win it and probably not have to go my all out. But I, I set myself up in the same position that I would be at World Championships. I went 100 percent effort in prelims. And in order to do that, I had to get my mind right and my body right to be able to do that because I knew I'd, I'd probably be in a very similar situation for World Championships. Um, I'm better at that now. I've, I've definitely struggled in the past. Um, I remember when I walked out for the finals of the 400 at Olympic trials in 2016, I was the top seed going into finals and I walked out last and the spotlights were on me. I could see 14,000 people, 17,000 people, whatever was looking at me and it just, it stopped me in my tracks and I lost what I was doing. I realized I, I was putting so much pressure on myself thinking this was, this was the swim that was going to define me and, you know, making this Olympic team and it just, I just was a train off the rails. It just, I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And it was, I realized after that meet, I really needed to work on my mindset, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of that whole idea where it's, you know, it's just another swim. It's just another swim, no matter who it is or what it's for. You know, it's just you out there racing your race strategy, doing what you know how to do and uh, being the best you can be. So that's really helped me, and especially um, swimming at the higher level, getting getting more experience before you know the, the bigger ones, say another world championships or the 2020 Olympic trials and the Olympics roll around. Um, I've been at a world championships now. I've raced some of the fastest guys in the world, and it's, it's really helped me think to myself, you know, I I can contend with these guys, and I'm just as good as they are. So a lot more confidence. Yeah, that's absolutely experience brings confidence, no doubt, and uh, certainly it's been so fun to watch you just escalate and escalate and get you know now now you're the one they fear right so um that's beautiful so tell us about the mohawk because my husband's here with us and he does he did his hair this morning and said this isn't this is an honor of zane yeah so i'll I'll have this spiked up tonight but um the mohawk was kind of a tradition that came from my club team um when i was younger all the all the guys in high school when i was say in elementary school they'd cut their hair real funny style someone would put a handprint in their hair someone put a nike swoosh because that was our sponsor um someone write words and stuff and they'd all just have fun shaving their head short uh their hair short for the the state meet and um I always wanted to do that too. Um, I found a cap. I'd never, I was never a guy to wear a cap. I always kept my hair short. But my senior year, I found a cap on deck and just threw it on. I wore it for a full year and grew my hair out and realized it's, it's now time to cut it and shave it for the, my last ever high school state meet. So we'll do it. And I cut it into a mohawk just for one day to have fun. And the next day, everyone's like, wow, that was super cool. And I thought to myself, that was super cool. Why did I cut it off? What was I thinking? So I told myself, I was like, the next year I'm going to do it again and I'm going to keep it for a week. And then I'll, you know, I'll be my freshman in college. I'll cut it the week before the SEC championship. And then when I get to the meet, I'll shave it off and make it serious and everything. And, um, when I got, I, when I got there and I, I cut the mohawk, a lot of the seniors on the team were giving me a lot of flack. They're thinking, oh, you think you want some attention? You think you're hot stuff? You better swim real fast. And I, I got a little defensive. I thought, I'm going to wear this mohawk and I'm going to swim fast and you guys are going to eat your words. And after the very first relay on the first day, the guys were like, you're not cutting it. You're keeping the mohawk. That's your thing. And I was like, you're dang right. It is. I'm definitely keeping this. And, I showed you, you know, yeah, so you every, every year through college, I'd, I'd cut it for the championship meet and maybe wear it through the summer. And then I'd cut it off going into the next year again. And, uh, I kind of, kind of kept with that routine for the last, you know, it's almost been a decade now. It's kind of just been, I'd, I'd cut it for the championship meet. You know, I train with Indiana university. I'd cut it for like the big 10 championship and let the guys know, like when the Mohawk comes out, it's go time. It's ready to swim fast. <laughs> and uh, I'd wear it through the summer through my long course meets and then cut it off. But, um, I, I've learned now that it, there, there aren't so many like short course seasons and long course seasons. It doesn't kind of shift and change that way now. It's just, I'm always ready to do my best at every meet I go to, whether it's arrest me or not so you know I, I, I'm keeping the mohawk permanent now as long as I can and um, it's kind of it's kind of my mentality to be like I'm, I'm I'm always ready to go so that is beautiful so I am as I've told you at the beginning of the interview I'm a fellow distance swimmer my favorite event is the 1650 and the 1500 and you probably know we have a little bit prior to you a little bit of a drought in American distance swimming it, and it's more that kids today 
they're just not embracing that 1650. Of course, Katie Ledecky is a different thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but in, in the men that I, this is what I hear from USA coaches is that, you know, the kids just, they're just not willing to put in that work. And I can give kids a million reasons why I love the 1650 and the 1500, but it's not going to mean anything coming from me. So obviously you love what you do. You're great at it. And can you give a little sales pitch for some young kids out there that, that are trying to choose what events to go into? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've definitely pondered the, the thought of, you know, why not only the United States has been kind of lacking, but why we haven't had a lot of top swimmers and everything. And I think it's a couple of things. I'd say when, uh, I'd, the, the sprint races definitely get more attention and they're a lot more fun. You know, they're quick and easy and you're powerful and you're strong when you do it. Um, I'd say the majority of distance swimmers when they're growing up, it wasn't really a choice, you know, <laughs> like in my case, you know, I, I remember my first driver's license said 6'1", 135 pounds. There's oh. no way I could be a sprinter <laughs> wow. with no muscle on my body. So, you know, you're kind of born into the distance life um, to begin with. Um, and then it's not really fostered with the NCAA system. Um, uh, I remember Swim Swim was doing some some articles about most valuable swimmers at the meet and everything, and they would always list the relay swimmers because they were scoring so many points. Those were always sprint races. You know, I was I was lucky enough to be able to get on the four by two relay, but if you're say a hundred butterfly or a hundred freestyler, you're maybe swimming all the relays as well as all your individual events. So it's definitely fostered that. Um, also, the fact that the United States has usually enough double up. Um, spots in Olympic trials to make the Olympic team and the world championship team that we're taking usually six positions in the 100 freestyle and the tuna freestyle um, to make those teams. A lot of people, you know, who may be a middle distance swimmer might be able to swim up. They might start focusing more towards the 200 and the 100 to try and earn those spots in those teams. Um, I've really embraced it. I, I like being good at things that other people aren't or people shy away from. You know, I... That, that, that definitely blossomed in the 1650. Uh, you know, the, the longest pool race you can do, a lot of people shy away from that. And I thought, you know, that's my slice of pie. That's, that's what I'm good at. So I'm going to stick with that. And it's kind of, it's kind of changed a little bit over the years. I've gotten a little bit more muscle starting to catch up on that with the 200 and the 400. But, um, I don't, I don't shy away from it. You know, I've, I've dropped huge times last year and, um, I take pride in the fact that it's, you know, potentially one of the hardest races out there. You know, if you ask any distance or sprinter, you know, what group do you want to be in? <laughs> the consensus is always, let's go in the sprint group. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it, I'd say it's harder training and it's probably a harder race, especially if you're, you know, in season and you're tired for it, but, um, it makes you more of a warrior, you know, and I, I've got to take a lot of pride in doing the hard stuff. So, and so we're trying to sell kids on this thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, is it fun? Yeah, it is fun. You know, it's, it's, it, you get to fly under the radar, you know, and, um, I, I've, I've always raced these distance races and, um, I was always thinking this is my one race or this is my one race. And now as a kind of well-rounded distance swimmer, I'm, you know, looking to make the Olympic team in three different races next year. So it gives me options. Yeah. Beautiful. And, um, what, uh, do you do to relax, to just like kind of de-stress yourself? Uh, when it comes to swim meets, definitely listening to music. It's kind of funny. Um, people ask me if I listen to music to get ready, and I do, but I also listen to music to stay calm. If you're thinking about your race two hours, three hours before you before you swim, you you you'll, your heart rate will be gone, your adrenaline will be gone, and you'll you'll probably waste yourself away. You'll be burning energy that you need for the for the race. But if you if uh, what I do is I, I listen to the music and I'll pick a playlist that's a little bit easier listening and it'll be it, it'll help keep me calm and keep me relaxed. So definitely listen to music or keeping my mind off the race will definitely help me relax. If you were going to give any message to young swimmers listening out there, um, what would you say might be an encouraging thing? Um, I'd say stick to your strengths and then work on your weaknesses. Um, that, that's a huge, that's a huge thing that a lot of people struggle with and maybe never even grasp through their swimming career is whatever your weakest thing in, thing is in practice or even in train or in racing, whether it's the kick sets or the pull sets. I hear a lot of swimmers say, I'm not, I'm not good at that. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'll go last. I'll always be bad at it, you know? You gotta understand that whatever you're worst at is your biggest room for improvement. And that could really be maybe your weapon coming around when it comes to, 
you're racing. I remember when I moved to Bloomington, I was terrible at pulling. And now, we just did a pull set earlier in the week. Nobody could touch me. Nobody could keep up with me. And now, it's really shining through my distance races. So, I'd say, I'd say um, learning how to balance um, your strengths and your weaknesses and, and keeping, keeping your options open. You know, whether it's also swimming to 400 IM or swimming down to a 200 and 100 freestyle or, or maybe even a 200 butterfly or 200 backstroke. Just keeping your options open and, and being, trying to be well-rounded, it, it helps, it helps um, not get so locked into, you know, staring at that black line and being so one-sided. I love it. So tell me about some changes you've been through and any other advice you might have. Um, I'd say maybe a little known fact is I, I have a lot of experience. You know, I, I had an entirely new coaching staff from the time I was a freshman in college to a senior in college. I've been through a lot of coaches there. I trained with Florida State University my first year out of college with an entirely new team and new new staff as well. And then by the time I got to Indiana, I've seen coaches come and go, teammates come and go, just a lot of changes. So. Um, it, it, it goes to say, not just for me having a lot of experience, but a lot of other swimmers who are a little bit older when it comes to that. Um, so my advice for the younger swimmers is um, if you need help with something, whether it's a technique change or just getting a little bit faster, not being so stale, um, definitely ask for help. There's plenty of, you know, the swimming community is very helpful. And whether it's a coach or a parent or even a lot of those older swimmers and teammates and stuff, they'd definitely be willing to give some advice, you know, and, and help that next generation because they've been in your shoes and they would have appreciated that too. So definitely be in there. That's beautiful. The pro swimming, I mean, how, how is it to be a pro swimmer? It kind of just fell in my lap. You know, I, I've always dreamt of the idea of being a pro swimmer. Um, my first year out of college, I wasn't on the national team. There was no way to me, for me to make any sort of money. Um, in fact, I was going to represent Canada because I knew that I was one of the fastest swimmers. My mother's Canadian, and I have Canadian, Canadian citizenship. Cool. So when I first moved to Bloomington, I thought, you know, I, I'm not making money from either team, and I think I can make the Canadian Olympic team. So that's probably going to be what I pursue. Um, I was already, I was definitely pursuing that. But by the time I got to the end of that summer, I beat out the second fastest guy in the country, Michael McBroom, in F1 freestyle, and thought, hey, I got a chance here. Um, I earned a, I earned a stipend from USA Swimming, and that came with you know health insurance nice. from the USOC. And then from there, I you know got a little bit better, and a little bit better. I was trying to you know a lot of times I was just trying to make the A final at a pro series. And then the next year, I was like, oh, let's see if I can get a top three spot. Then the next year, let's see if I can be a top three in everything. And I, I've it kind of gotten to the point where it's like I want to win every race I swim. You know, yeah. it's, it's kind of just it kind of just builds on itself as long as I keep progressing and. Um, so the aspects of being a pro swimmer, whether it's, you know, not having to do school and doing um, homework and everything, but making the money and everything like that, it, that, that was never what it was really about to begin with. And it's not, you know, not really the focus now. It's a, it's a nice um, thought to be able to put aside and think, you know, I can make money and live off this. But um, just just understanding that I can I can dedicate a lot of my time to my my craft and and help me focus that way. But. It's, it's, it's more of a mindset, I'd say, than, than really, you know, a job or a position to be in. What does your road to the 2020 Olympics look like? So um, I've got about 12 or 13 months until the Olympic trials next year. Um, first step will be world championships. I'll be racing my three best races, 400, 800, 1500. Um, the first goal for that is to make finals in all three, which is going to be a big step swimming the 800 twice, the mile twice as well. Um, and then from there, really just try and, you know, win a medal in each of those. That'd be, that'd be huge for me. Um, after that, I'm not sure what I'll be doing in December. Hopefully a rest meet, whether it's yards or long course, we'll see a little, a little reprieve from the, the hard training through, through the fall. And then I'll probably be going through all the pro series again next year. Um, hitting the ones that are convenient and, and, and state of the plan and with training. Um, when I go to Olympic trials, I'll be definitely racing the 400, the 800, the 1500 again. Um, it's still up in the air with me and my coach, whether I'll be doing the tuner free. I know I'm good at it. I've got another one tonight. Um, <laughs> but it, it does, if I were to make top six and make the relay, it would put a little bit of pressure on myself to try and swim that and the 800 at the Olympics if I were to make both. Um, so obviously that's a goal and I'd have to think about that, but that's still up in the air. 
Um, if I were to make the Olympic team in those three races, it would be no different than world championships. I'd be trying to make the final in all three, and then I'd be trying to make a, win a medal. I'm, I'm not afraid to, to let everyone know that it, you know, I, I did what I could, and I tried to be the best I could, and that was what I was striving for. How about your long-range plans for swimming? Um, uh, fortunately for me, being a, kind of a late bloomer, it's really helped me progress through sport. But at the same time, I'm training at the top level, and I'm lucky enough to have figured out the right diet, you know, to stay healthy and keep my body healthy through this incredibly intense training to not be have shoulder injuries or just be wearing down and everything. Um, I've got a coach that trusts me too that can I can make changes with and. Um, as my body changes, the, the training changes too. So um, the first the first checkpoint, I'd say, would be the Olympic trials and the Olympics in, in, in Tokyo 2020. Um, ideally, I would love to keep swimming after that. You know, um, I'd, I'd be 28, and I know as far as distance swimming goes, as, you know, if it's anything like distance running and the and endurance doesn't really fall off much and I can handle the training, I'd, I'd love to be able to keep going, you know, whether it's I'd just maybe take it one season at a time and go from there like I did after 2016 see what happens after that um mom always told me that you're not gonna be a swimmer forever so <laughs> work hard in school too so i i got my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering and i would love at some point you know my life to be able to be working for a space company like spacex or, or boeing or something like that whether it's working on jet engines or or actual rockets you know and so i'd love to be in that industry too i have to finish the interview as i'm sitting here watching i see that you have four wristbands a pink one a multi blue and and then a tan one and an orange one. So can you just give me a quick explanation of those? Yeah. So in 2008, my older sister was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Hmm. And she um, had to stay home from college for hmm. treatment and everything. And she ended up earning a really good scholarship through the Livestrong Foundation. And so our entire family started wearing Livestrong bands. And they're pretty hardy. I started sleeping with it, showering with it, swimming with it. I mean, it lasts quite a long time. They'll last through all those hours in, in chlorinated water for at least maybe two years before they finally fall apart and break themselves. But that's kind of where I originally started, and that was way back in 2008. Um, and I've slowly added a couple here and there. But um, every year at the beginning of the school year at Auburn, they always had wristbands sitting on the table, and no one batted an eye. And I thought, oh, I had one in my collection. So nice. I've got one that, an orange one that says Auburn Pride, and it kind of reminds me, you know, like, I, I may have struggled a little bit mentally or, you know, even w um, working with my coaches at Auburn, but I, I learned a lot and I, I definitely love the school so much and I'll, I'll always be a Tiger. So I keep that. Um, and then another wristband I have um, says Nigu. It's an it's a incredible foundation that works with uh, kids with cancer. Never, ever give up. And it's always a, a personal statement of mine as well as, you know, being able to. I've worked with the with the foundation before in the past, and um, they were one of the sponsors that I was racing for last year with the swim squad. So um, I still have that wristband, and it's, it's still in the back of my mind. Um, a buddy of mine, uh, my best friend from college, uh, John, he's got a friend who works for this company called Love Your Melon, and they work with um, families who have kids with cancer as well. And, um, you know, it's always been personal with my family, you know, right. with my sister and everything. But uh, so he, he sent me one of these little white wristbands, and I've had that for three or four years now. So that's wow. that fits in nicely with the with the theme. And the pink one's kind of faded now, but um, it said pos positivity is the, the best medicine. And that was for Nikki Nolte, who swims at Penn State. And she she's had cancer, and that's a battle of hers that she's been working with. And, you know, I when I knew that they were selling wristbands, it was, you know, easy for me to jump on it and support her cause and, you know, be able to try and swim through college with that because it, it was very similar to what my sister was trying to do as well. So. How's your sister doing? She's good. You know, she awesome. she uh, she went ahead and had surgery about a year after, um, and she's 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 had uh, some checkups here and there. But I mean, that was quite a while ago. She's just about ready to have her third child, and wow. awesome. everything's going good. Wow, beautiful, great. beautiful. Well, Zane, I have to say that you are have just been so very. Um, entertaining and wise and amazing for your young age. I mean, you think you're old for a swimmer, but you're, yeah. you're young. And, uh, I really, really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm a breast cancer survivor, so I, I can totally relate to all those and that that's just beautiful. Do you swim with those? I do. Like, do you race with them? I've raced occasionally. If I do poorly, I may reflect badly. So <laughs> I, I tend to take them off when I race. Yeah, you are not going to be wearing this at Olympic trials. I will not. Be. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else for anybody? Okay. Thank you so, Thank you much. so much. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for Thank having you. me. 
Well, Maria, there you have it from Zane Grothy with uh, the big heart. So, what what do you think? Well. <laughs> what he opened with rocked my world. And I don't know why it should. I'm an endurance athlete. I understand pain. But he said, you know, he he's, he's, he started by saying, you know, our, our natural inclination is to stop when we are when we when we experience physical discomfort or pain. Um, but he said he doesn't do that. He challenges himself to know how to push himself to see how much he can hurt. And, you know, that might not sound so amazing to other people, but that just, I just love that. Yes, we can, so much of what we can do is in our mind, you know, and and he says that he just, he just goes and he goes um, until his body gives out. He doesn't want his mind to give out before his body does. He's not going to give himself a break. And that just, I don't know, that just blew my mind. What did you think, Kelly? Oh, I, I had so many takeaways. I mean, I definitely related to that as, you know, as a fellow um, endurance athlete. I also was struck by just how mature and authentic he was in talking about his 2016 Olympic trials Um as he described it, you know, the train went off the track. You know, he yeah. was seated first going into the 400 and looked up at the crowd looking at him and, and uh, didn't, he lost you know, it. Did, it did not happen for him. So yeah, his just his ability to kind of describe that and, and learn from it, I thought was huge and um, humble in many ways. I know um, it, it's it's. It's one of one of Mark Bernardino's uh, techniques or, or traits of a champion is to be humble. But uh, the guy was very is very humble yet yet confident. So it's a it's a nice combination where he saw his his um, failure there, if you want to call it that, and then in the follow up to that is later in the interview where he's not he says he's not afraid to share his goals yes and yes you know, if, i if, heard that too i yeah. thought this is a brave soul he's yeah. he's telling it like it is this is what i want to do he's courageous like um yeah. if he makes them great if not he's human and so yeah. that juxtaposition of just vulnerability and risk was just so so authentic and um and inspiring to me yeah. Another way he showed his vulnerability, I don't know, or, or his humility was talking about how how younger and older swimmers inspired him. Um, and, you know, and, the, and that his his role models were, you know, were swimmers from, you know, from 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 different ages. And and, and later in the interview, he talked about asking for help. Which is, you know, that's so true. Sometimes we can, our pride can keep us from just asking everybody for for help. And that was one of his his bits of advice. Um, and, and apparently he's, you know, he's done it. He moved himself around to get in a position where he can improve his swimming by being with other swimmers that could help him. So, yeah, very, this is a, a young man of incredible character. Right. And, you know, he is he's 27. So he's a little bit older than, um, you know, some of the swimmers that would be at this, you know, kind of iconic position. He's a little bit older. He's hung in there through right. these changes, tons of changes. He said, you know, even during his college career, he had a lot of changes in coaches. Yeah. I think he said he That's had right. a, he said that. Uh -huh. different coaching, you know, uh, many different coaches while he was at Auburn. And then, you know, he's had a, another coaching change. So, you know, he does have the experience, which is nice that he's learning from the experience. So I, I really found that um, that part of, you know, his interview would inspire listeners to think, you know, just because I've had changes. I mean, a lot of people are afraid of changes, but um, maybe you've got some changes going on in your life that don't feel comfortable. But in the end, I really think that they they make one stronger if you can kind of gain that experience that he did. You know, he's he's gained that experience, which he said has has definitely made him stronger. Yeah, he talked about the experience of the Olympic trials and now he puts himself under pressure. 
He says, I practice as if, you know, I go out at every meet. I go out as if this were the most important meet of my life. And, and that kind of goes with the Mohawk thing. You know, he's he he puts himself under pressure. And I think he did that in the interview by saying what his goals were. I I I admire that so much that he can say this is it. This is what I'm going for. And and he also said that every meet he goes to, you know, is now he's it's it's he's he's going to go out there and go for it. Yes, definitely. Um, another takeaway that I really connected with was in sticking to your strengths, but working on your weaknesses. And certainly, it's easy to apply that in swimming, where you think, okay, I'm a I'm a good puller. I'm not a good kicker, but now I'm going to work on my kick. But I think that can apply to our lives that, you know, sometimes in life we find we do the things that we're good at and, you know, maybe we avoid those little things that we have, you know, to work on because it's a little harder. So I think if um, one could think, you know, what is a weakness in, you know, in a certain area, if you're, if you're trying to, you know, do a 5k run or or lose weight what is my weakness in those areas that i could work on that would really connect to my strengths yeah i i think that's great i i and he and he talked about the if you working on your weakness it can become he called it your secret weapon i love that image so i've got this weakness that i can work on what you know whatever it is for me for me like in cycling my weakness is I'm an endurance rider, so my weakness is starting fast. I, I'm very afraid of it. I'm afraid of um, of the starts, the mass starts. There's a lot going on there. Um, and so when I listened to that, I thought that that's a weakness that I can work on, and that could become my, my secret power. And I actually have worked on it, and I've gotten better at it. I'm less intimidated by it. But, yeah, it's great. It's it's a great way to look at weaknesses as a potential superpower, <laughs> secret weapon. Yes, yes. And and I would say um, he started off the whole interview by saying, I make it personal. And I, I think one of the things that one of my favorite questions that I asked Zane was at the very end, you know, I'm sitting there with him at the interview table and he's wearing four of the little, you know, bands that are around his wrist and most of those were supporting other people. And so he is just a very caring person. He seems to take, you know, his personal relationships seriously and support them and, you know, tell people to ask for help if they need it. I just feel like he's got a very almost a Zen like, like Zane is Zen in, yeah. you know, connecting with um, the causes and the people that he cares about and making things personal. And I was just, I was very touched by, you know, his big heart, his maturity, and his grounded, hey, I'm going to, these are my goals. And if I make them great, and if I don't, you know, uh, obviously, the guy is a champion, whether he ends up with a gold medal around his neck or somewhere in between. But I just, um, you know, I was inspired and raised up by getting to spend the time with Zane Grothy. Yes, he's you got the impression he helps people whenever he can. He he swims with those bands on his wrist. He does, and um, he thinks about people. His, he had he said he told us that he had cancer. um and his family, his sister had cancer, and and so yes, you you know that he's out there. You get the impression he's out there helping people in any way that he can. I I I thought that was amazing, and I also loved, and you alluded to it, that he says I'm going to go out there and do the best I can, and then I'm going to know that I gave my best, <laughs> and if it if the results aren't what I'd hoped for, then then they are. He, he's he's just very very big hearted mature sounding individual and one little tip that he gave that i loved or at least the way he put it i loved this expression he talked about fruits and vegetables we were talking about his diet or you were asking about his diet and he talked about fruits and vegetables being like the oil so you have your carbs and fats and protein or the, the fuel but but the fruits and vegetables are the oil and i just 
uh, was thinking about that this week, thinking about eating lots and lots of fruits and vegetables because that's that's what's going to keep keep my body in top working shape. So that that inspired me too. Really, really liked this guy. Yes, I know you said that <laughs> of all the interviews you listened to, and you know, like we said at uh, one of the earlier ones, you were gone for a couple of weeks, and I did these four interviews at the Bloomington um, Pro Swim Series, and you said, boy. What Zane said is just really stuck with me, and I've been doing all this stuff all week. So I'm glad to hear that that was one of the eating fruits and vegetables, and it actually touched me as well. So we're we're probably got some people out there to eat fruits and vegetables. Thank you, Zane. Um, and <laughs> yeah, thanks, yeah. Zane. and so um, that with that, we are going to have an episode actually called "Eating Like a Champion." So that's yeah. one of our future um, future podcasts. So um, let's move on to our action items. Yeah, the action item I have is for myself and also for anybody else out there. Um, And it was the very first thing that Zane came out with about challenging yourself to deal with pain. And I think this can be, I mean, I think about it, obviously, with my endurance cycling or running, but I think it can be with other things, too. how, How much pain can I manage? And, and that pain isn't a bad thing that, you know, pain is, is, is not necessarily, uh, we can teach ourselves to endure, endure pain and, and make, and help ourselves go, go farther. So my personal challenge is to challenge myself, uh, in my training and in other things to move through the pain and become more mentally strong. Beautiful. That is a great one. Um, I think a good action item for me and for anybody who might want to join me is um, to just kind of inventory an area that I'm I'm working on, whatever that might be, you know, this week or for you listeners is uh, make an inventory of your strengths and your weaknesses and choose to work on your weakness this week. You know, just um, what is it that, you know, I, I know, you know, Maria, you know, that my husband has become obsessed with pickleball, which I'm, I don't even want to go into what it is or why it is, but it's a new little game that I'm <laughs> trying to learn to play. And I like to do the big sweeping. It's basically a combo between ping pong and tennis. I like to do the sweeping fun, you know, hits over the net, the long hits or the big serves, but the volleying at the net is really what makes people great in pickleball and I just don't like it I just like it's it's my weakness but I don't like to do it I don't know why it's just it's just not fun or it's boring or whatever but I have some really good strengths like um you know I have a great serve and I have some good ground strokes and um but I just I need to work on the the other part um when I can my schedule doesn't allow me to play a lot of pickleball but um I want to do it to be with my spouse and you know when you're in a relationship you've got to you got to give 50-50 and Mark loves it. So that's why I'm playing pickleball. But anyway, so that your net game's going to be your secret weapon. My net game will be oh yeah, that would be if I could be a volleyer, I'd I'd have a secret weapon. So anyway, um so that's the action item, inventory strength and weaknesses and choose to work on your weaknesses this week. So very good and we're going to do the quote of the week and then um come on back. This week's quote is from William Hazlitt. The seat of knowledge is in the head of wisdom in the heart. So it has just been another great time with you, Maria. And um, we are just having so much fun with this. If people like our podcast, please subscribe on Champions Mojo um, at YouTube. And then if you can leave us a review on iTunes, we greatly appreciate it. So that is a wrap. Yes, thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate it. You can reach out and email us or comment on the podcast, and uh, we would love to hear what you have to say. Thanks so much. We are so grateful that you spent this time with us today, and we hope that you heard something that inspired, motivated, and educated you. Signing off for myself and my champion co-host, Maria Parker, we hope you'll join us again soon, and we know you can be a champion. Thank you for listening, and please see below for a copy of the show notes for any links or important information that we've referenced here. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast, designed to make you feel inspired, motivated, and educated. 
Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Also, visit championsmojo.com to learn more.